We all love those retro buddy films like Bill and Ted and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So what do you get when you combine the essence of an 80s buddy film with the genius of programmer David Crane? You get the classic but not too often discussed NES puzzle adventure A Boy and His Blob. And you don't want to miss all the secret pro tips and history I'm going to share in this video. Let's get started. If this is your first time here at the channel, my name is Tyler, and if you love gaming from all generations like we do here at G3, then consider hitting that subscribe button and hit that bell for notifications so you don't miss anything. A Boy and His Blob, Trouble on Blobalonia is definitely not your traditional NES adventure. You take control of a kid whose actual character name is Boy, who comes to the aid of his shape-shifting sidekick named Blobbert to help him save his home planet Blobalonia. The game starts out on Earth in the ever so advanced 21st century, and the manual tells you it's now commonplace for kids to have a buddy from outer space. The duo makes it their mission to save Blobbert's planet from the evil Emperor Blob. Soup. The Emperor is cruel to his people and forces everyone to eat marshmallows and chocolate. No offense, but this guy doesn't really sound that bad. So Blobbert and the boy have to collect money on Earth to buy vitamins cause the healthy supplements are actually poisonous to the Emperor. And lucky for you, your friend the Blob is actually a shapeshifter who can transform into various items to help you along your quest. Like a ladder, bridge, or trampoline, just to name a few. And just exactly how does Blobbert do all that shapeshifting? Well, it turns out that Blobbert loves jelly beans. And these aren't just any old jelly beans. These are extraordinary jelly beans! Anytime Blobbert is given a different flavored jelly bean, he changes shape and helps he and the boy make it through otherwise impossible situations. Now you have to admit, this is a pretty bold and unique premise for an adventure game in the late 80s. But when you realize who the creative force behind a boy and his blob David Crane is, you'll realize he's no stranger to marching into unknown territory in the gaming industry. David Crane is an American video game programmer who started his career at Atari in the 70s making games for the Atari 2600. Crane, along with his co-worker and fellow Atari programmer Alan Miller, became increasingly frustrated with the lack of recognition Atari gave to its programmers when creating a game. They ultimately left Atari in 1979 and co-founded Activision, which is still recognized as the first third-party video game developer and remains a huge player in the gaming industry today. One of Crane's initial claims to fame was being the designer for the classic Atari 2600 hit released by Activision named Pitfall. This vine-swinging and crocodile-jumping adventure was unlike anything else in 1982 on the Atari, and it sold over 4 million copies. And I can definitely see elements of Pitfall Harry and the two-level platforming design in A Boy and His Blob as well. But David finally got the chance to design and program an NES game along with his former Activision colleague Gary Kitchen, who was now the president of Absolute Entertainment who developed A Boy and His Blob. Crane said the idea of the blob was heavily inspired by the Hanna-Barbera characters Gloop and Gleep from the cartoon The Herculoids. I know David Crane never mentioned this, but I'm pretty sure he took a bit of inspiration from Indiana Jones for the game as well. I mean, the font style of the titles look pretty similar, and those first few bars from the title screen song are almost identical to Indy's theme. <laughs> Crane realized how adventure games had evolved since Pitfall, and that now many of them rely on various items and tools you need to advance in the games. One thing he disliked was the item menus and their constant interruptions in gameplay. This is where the concept of the blob transforming into the necessary items you need came to be. But when asked why he specifically used jelly beans as the means to cause these transformations, he simply stated, why not? At the end of production, 14 different jelly bean flavors and transformations were put in the game. He understood this would be a little overwhelming to remember what all these flavors would correspond to, so he tried to use puns or alliteration to help you. Like the licorice jelly bean starting with an L so it changes to a ladder, or vanilla sounding like umbrella. Normally it takes around 6-8 to eight months for a team to develop an NES game. Crane developed a boy in his blob in the summer of 1989 in only 6 weeks, so he could meet the deadline of being able to present the game at the CES trade show in Chicago. He knew he was going to have to focus on nothing but this game to meet that demand, so he rented a room in a flop house near his office working as much as 20 hours a day to finish the game. Crane said he remembers losing sleep over making sure he didn't forget little attentions to detail for the players, like having bubbles placed correctly in the water to give a more realistic feel to the game. All of Crane's hard work paid off because the game won Best of Show at the 1989 CES. And this award came just one day prior to the deadline to submit a boy and his blob to Nintendo for final approval. 
A Boy and His Blob, Trouble on Blobalonia, officially released in January of 1990 in North America, November 1990 in Japan, and 1991 in Europe. Let's take a look at the manual so I can give you a basic feel for the gameplay before I reveal my secret pro tips. So like I said earlier, you start out on Earth where you need to collect money and treasure to buy vitamins so you can poison the Emperor once you reach Blobalonia. You are only in direct control of the boy, and the blob follows close by as your sidekick. But if you do get separated, you can always whistle by tapping the B button and Blobbert will make his way to you. At the bottom of the screen are your different flavors of jelly beans you can feed the blob to make him transform. Here's a quick list of all the jelly beans and their transformations you can screenshot for quick reference. You may have noticed the manual lists the grape jelly bean, which actually didn't make it to the final game. The original use of this bean was to turn Blobber into a wall and call it the Grape Wall of China, which could repel enemies. Workers at Nintendo noticed that sometimes the boy would get separated from Blobber and no matter how much whistling or backtracking they did, they couldn't proceed any further and felt this was a major flaw in a game Nintendo otherwise loved. So Crane decided to scrap the grape bean and create a new jelly bean that would allow Blobbert to catch up to the boy at any time, and thus the mysterious ketchup flavored jelly bean was born. You can toss a ketchup jelly bean at any time you're separated from Blobbert and he'll immediately appear, which is definitely handy, but don't abuse this feature. And don't try to feed a ketchup jelly bean to Blobbert either, because he doesn't like them. And that's one thing Blobbert and I have in common. We both hate ketchup. For real, it's about the only smell I can think of that will make me want to vomit, and my kids Blake and Emma and my wife love to torture me with it. Just check out this video they made of me playing pie face with ketchup a few years ago. How many did he get, Mommy? You can turn Blobber into a brick if you feed him a honey jelly bean and during his transformation give him a ketchup jelly bean. This was a fun little nod to the Grape Wall of China idea Crate had to begin with. Now that's pretty much all the gaming basics you need to know. So let's get to my secret pro tip so you can master a boy and his blob. My first pro tip is don't worry about finding all the treasure. Now yes, finding the treasure throughout the game is important for getting the vitamins. But don't be driving yourself crazy to find every piece. Cause that treasure counter at the top of the screen at first made me believe you had to have all the treasure before you could get the vitamins to fight the emperor. Most of the times when I get the vitamins at the store, I still have a couple of treasures left that I didn't bother grabbing. Cause some of the treasures, like the ones near the pointy rocks in the water, aren't the easiest to grab without losing a life. But don't confuse the treasure with the jelly bean bags. There are two jelly bean bags you need to find to get extra beans throughout the game. The first is on the left hand side of this ledge in the subterranean region, and the other and most crucial is in the top left corner of the blue colored stage just before you resurface from the subway. The reason this second one is so crucial is that this bag contains the lime jelly beans, which you must have to complete the game, which we will cover here in a bit. Pro tip number two is learning how to properly avoid those annoying subway serpents. You encounter quite a few of these during your time on Earth, and in my experience, you have a pretty narrow window to make it past these guys. Remember, there's no jump button in this game, and these guys will kill you with one hit. But I figured out a pretty fail-safe method of making it past them. They jump back and forth in a predictable arc, so I get as close as I can to where its head hits the ground closest to the boy, and as soon as its head reaches the ground at the furthest point away, I immediately dash to run underneath the serpent. Pro tip number three is the hole punch drop through technique. When you use the punch flavored jelly beans, Blobbert will turn into a manhole for the boy to fall through. But if you stay immediately under the hole you fell through and whistle for the blob, the hole will fall straight down on top of the boy and he'll immediately fall through to the next level. This can be both a blessing and a curse, cause it can really help you if you need to escape an enemy. But if you're not careful, it can send you plummeting to your death, so choose wisely. Now the tangerine jelly beans, which transform Blobbert into a trampoline, are critical for making your way back to the surface on Earth and Blobalonia. And even more important is the proper placement of Blobbert and his trampoline, cause if you veer only slightly off course of the trampoline on a high jump, you will miss the trampoline and die. But there is this one critical high jump you need to make in the subterranean region on Earth where you have to jump multiple screens to a high ledge on the left. You need to place the trampoline in a very precise spot and it's really frustrating to try to get Blobber to this spot on his own. So feed him a cinnamon jelly bean so you can use the line in the middle of the blowtorch to place Blobber on this exact spot here so you can safely reach the top. Pro tip number four is using the coconut jelly bean to scout multiple future screens and wipe out enemies on Blobalonia. 
Just have your coconut jelly bean selected to turn Blobbert into a coconut, then pick it up and start out from the far left of the screen, get a run and go and throw the coconut just before you reach the right edge of the screen to send it rolling past several screens ahead. Once it stops, make your way right and whistle for Blobbert until he comes back to meet you. You can repeat this as much as necessary to make it through Blobalonia with little difficulty. Pro tip number 5 is definitely a spoiler alert if you haven't beat the game before. So I'm warning you because I'm going to tell you how to properly access the Emperor's Lair and defeat him with the vitamins. Once you've made it all the way to the end of the Blobalonia cave, you'll notice a keyhole on the right wall. Remember those lime jelly beans I said were critical? This is exactly why they're so important. You can feed Blobbert one of the lime jelly beans and he turns into a key. Pick it up and make your way to the Emperor's Lair. Once inside the lair, you'll notice the Emperor Sup, dude. on the right side of the screen and he has Blobbert in a cage in the center of the room with a jar of vitamins placed on a shelf near the Emperor. Select an apple jelly bean which will transport Blobbert into a jack. Make a quick run and go from the left to toss it to Blobbert and the jack will bust open the roof of the cage spilling the vitamins on the Emperor to finally take him down and save all of Blobalonia. You'll get a quick thank you for your efforts and you get to hang out with a Michelin man for a bit. So those are my pro tips for a more legitimate playthrough of a boy and his blob. But there are a few glitches you can take advantage of to make it through faster. For example, a faster route to the Emperor's Lair goes like this. When you first reach Blobalonia, head all the way to the last screen on the left. Throw a jelly bean to the left side of the screen and most of the time it won't do anything. But run back and forth and keep tossing jelly beans at the left side of the screen and you may get lucky and trigger a glitch where you can toss the bean to the screen where the final boss, the Emperor, is. You have to pay close attention because you'll only see the scene for a split second. Once you see this screen, head right and pretty much all the enemies have now disappeared and you can easily make your way to the Emperor's lair to finish him off. A Boy and His Blob, Trouble on Blobalonia has received mixed reviews over the years. Electronic Gaming Monthly and IGN both gave the game mediocre scores, feeling it didn't live up to its full potential being that the jelly bean concept felt gimmicky and was trying to make up for the mostly empty worlds with little enemies, and I really can't argue with them on that. But what's strange is IGN has A Boy and His Blob ranked 74th in its top 100 NES games of all time list. I mean, don't get me wrong, I obviously enjoyed this game, but I was pretty surprised it was that high on their list. I only started playing this game fairly recently, and it was suggested by a co-worker who really enjoyed it growing up. I have always enjoyed the trial and error style of puzzle adventure games like Dragon's Lair and Sega CD FNV games, so I felt right at home with this game. A sequel to the NES title was released on the Game Boy called The Rescue of Princess Blobette, and a contemporary reimagining of A Boy and His Blob was released on the Wii and other modern consoles more recently. So A Boy and His Blob has definitely left a sound legacy in gaming, and I'm glad my friend reminded me to try this one-of-a-kind NES title. Make sure to give this video a like and let us know in the comments below what you think about A Boy and His Blob. Special shout out to Hour A Day Gamer for finding Mullet Boy first for the second week in a row in our last Who is the Real Super Macho Man video. Till next time guys, G3 out.